in May of uh, 2000s when I went on staff at my very first church. And the problem with that was I had shut my businesses down at the end of 1999. So that meant there was like a five month period or so where I was unemployed. Now to solve that, one of the guys at the church that I was getting ready to pastor at, his name was Gary, he owned an elevator company. He said, why don't you like just ride around in the truck with me every day. I'll pay you a couple bucks. You can be my helper. We'll get to know one another. Now, for those of you that know me, you know that I am not mechanically inclined at all. So this was like a horrible job for me to do. But yet I actually enjoyed it. I actually learned a whole lot as I rode around with Gary. And at the time he would, he was done doing like new installations. Basically he was just doing preventative maintenance. In other words, every single month, every single elevator that anywhere in the U.S. has to have a check done on it. And it, I forget how many it is. It's like 30 different things. And we would go in. We would probably do anywhere from 20 to 30 elevators every single day. You just go in. You go through your 30-point checklist. Then you drive off to the next one and do it again. Now, what you may not know is that every couple years, an elevator has to go through what's called a load test. And what that means is if you've been on an elevator and you've looked at the little sign there, it says maximum weight and whatever the maximum weight is. Well, again, every couple of years, what you have to do is actually load that elevator with the maximum weight. Those were the days that I didn't like because that meant that I was just lugging weights all day long onto an elevator to, to load it down. But once you had that maximum weight on an elevator, what you do then is you intentionally make it, quote unquote, crash. You make it fail. Now, you guys have seen way too many movies where you see a car that's like way, way up in a skyscraper or something and the cable breaks and it goes plunging all the way down the elevator shaft to a fiery crash below. Well, guess what? When we intentionally would make an elevator fail, if it even dropped a half an inch, that was a failure. In other words, if you were ever on an elevator and a cable actually snapped, you probably wouldn't even know that anything had happened. It would just sort of stop. And that'd be it. Now, that kind of safety is due to a man by the name of Elisha Otis. You've heard of the Otis Elevator Company. Well, how did the Otis Elevator Company become famous? How did they become the world leader? Well, it's very simply because Elisha Otis was the guy that came up with what's called the safety break, or in the elevator industry, it was called the governor. And basically what it does is helps elevators not to come crashing down if a cable would happen to break. He comes up with this invention. The problem was nobody believed him. He said, I've got this great invention that's going to keep these elevators from, from crashing below. Now, keep in mind at the time, the cabling for an elevator was just ropes. He said, I I've got this thing that will keep it from, from falling, but nobody believed him. And so in 1853, the World's Fair was being held in New York. And he got the contract to put the elevator into this place called the Crystal Palace. It was basically this, this huge building, all the different wares and all the latest inventions and gadgets were going to be displayed there in this couple story building. So he had gotten the contract to put this elevator in and everything was so open in the building. So he decided to do the elevator the exact same way. In other words, you could see not only the car going up and down, but you could see all the inner workings of the elevator as well, including the, the rope that was there. So here's the idea he had. He got the car all the way up to the top and he made sure that it was empty. And then he himself got up on some scaffolding and he got the crowd's attention because everybody in the place was able to see everywhere in the building. He gets their attention and he calls their attention then up to the car above. Now, he had an assistant up there, and he yells out, cut the rope! And they cut the rope. The crowd gasps, and the car doesn't drop. His brake had worked. And that's what propelled them to become the world's leading company as far as elevators are concerned. Up to that point, buildings were never built more than, say, five stories tall, because most people, number one, they didn't want to have to walk all the stairs up. And then they didn't trust elevators any taller than that. But because of his invention of the safety brake, it was by 1908 that New York City alone had 538 skyscrapers. So just in a 50-year period, he changed not only the elevator industry, he changed how buildings were being built. Fast forward now to today. 
the world's population rides an Otis elevator every three days. He literally changed how we build things and how we ride elevators, which brings me then to the fifth habit in our series, Win the Day. All of us at some point have to get to a place where we cut the rope, where we take that chance, where we prove what it is that we have believed in our hearts. He had this dream that, you know, my, my invention will save lives and it'll allow buildings to be built taller and taller and taller and taller, but nobody believed him until he decided to cut the rope. And you've got to cut the rope in some way in your life. So if you got a Bible here this morning, you want to turn to Mark chapter 4, that's where we're going to hang out at. Mark chapter 4, we're going to talk about how cutting the rope is going to be the doorway to fulfilling your dreams. I do want to welcome those of you that are watching online. It's great to have you with us today. In the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you see a little button there. It's called Talk Notes. If you'll push that, that's going to take you to all the notes I'm going to be looking at today, including the scriptures. For those of you live in the room, if you want your smartphone, you can go to our website, exponential.church, and that's going to get you to all the talk notes there and the points as well. Now, as you're continuing to turn to Mark chapter 4, let me introduce you to a concept. Uh, a guy by the name of Cal Newport, he wrote a book called Deep Work, and he gives this idea of what's called the grand gesture. A, a grand gesture is this defining moment where you physically do something to signify to others that here's a major decision that I have made, or, or here's a, a calculated risk that I'm about to take. So for Elisha Otis, the grand gesture was cutting the rope. I made a grand gesture in the fall of 1994 when I got down on one knee and I proposed to Lisa. That's a grand gesture. Maybe for you, a grand gesture is you, you take a, a, a selfie in the mirror right before you get ready to start a new exercise program or a new diet. That's a, a grand gesture. For some people, uh, a grand gesture would be uh, something like what the, the uh, they used to be called one-way missionaries. I don't know if you've ever heard this term before. But what these people would do like 100 years ago, 200 years ago, they were called onto the mission field. They wouldn't pack all their belongings in a suitcase. They would pack all their belongings in a coffin. And that's how they would go overseas then. That was a grand gesture. What it was signifying to others is, I don't ever intend on coming back. I'm so committed to this mission, I'm going to die on the mission field. There's plenty of examples from Scripture as well of grand gestures. We have Noah, he builds a boat. Abraham, he places Isaac up on the altar. Israel, they circle the walls of Jericho seven times. Esther, she fasts for three days. Elisha, he burns the plows. James and John, they drop their nets. Peter climbs out of the boat. Zacchaeus climbs up to a tree. The Ephesians burn their scrolls. That's just the name of you. Again, a grand gesture is this physical act, something that you do that signifies this calculated risk that you're about to take. It's signifying to other people that I've come to a tipping point. And this moment is going to change everything. And it's not about just this moment either. This moment is going to change my life and the lives of others for years and decades yet to come. So at some point, well, I've got to cut the rope. Let's pick it up in Scripture then. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. We read this. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. Now, let me give you a little bit of context here. Jesus had been preaching on the west shore of the Sea of Galilee all day long. He is exhausted. And now it's evening time. And he's like, okay, we, we just, we got to get away from the crowds for a little bit. Let's just get in the boat. Let's cross over to the other side. Now, what you need to understand about the Sea of Galilee is that it's 13 miles long. It's eight miles wide. Okay. So you're picturing this in your mind. Jesus gives this command to him at evening. Now keep in mind, in that day and time, there wasn't motorboats to just quickly get you to the other side. So they're going to depend on the wind. They're going to depend on maybe a little bit of rowing as well. But because it's evening, because the sun is setting, it means it's going to be dark as they continue the journey, which is dangerous. When you're a sailboat, and you're depending on the wind just to sort of take you you have just a little bit of navigation with some oars. That's dangerous to do. So this is a dangerous mission that they're about to embark on. 
We continue on in verse 36, the very first part of the verse. It says, so they left the crowd behind. Now, I'm going to give you a couple little mini sermons within today's sermon. So this is the first one, okay? Sometimes you just got to leave the crowd behind. Sometimes you can't just do what everybody else is doing. You know, in this day and age, we are bombarded with radio, newspaper, TV, the internet, social media. I mean, there's just all kinds of advertisements and various things that are going on. Thousands and thousands and thousands of things that you're hearing and taking in every day. And the, the truth of the matter is a lot of it's just noise. But what's weird is a lot of it's noise that we do by choice. Did you know that the average American now spends 142 minutes per day on social media? That represents 15% of your waking hours. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you really want 15% of your life to be spent on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and YouTube? Is that really how you want to spend your time? And remember, as followers of Jesus, he wants to be speaking to us. And the way he speaks to us is through his spirit, through his still, small voice to us. What's t- it's tough. It's hard to hear that still small voice if you've got all this other noise that's just going on in your life all the time. And so one of the things we've got to do is we've got to be be very, very intentional about making sure that the still small voice is still the loudest voice in our lives. We've got to sometimes be intentional about getting away from the crowd. We've got to get away from what it is that everybody else is doing. So there's sermon number one within the sermon. That didn't cost you any extra at all. Let's actually read the full verse, verse 36. So they left the crowd behind, and his disciples started across the lake with Jesus in the boat. Some other boats followed along as well. Now, let me give you a little bit more context. The Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level. Picturing this? It's 700 feet below sea level. It's surrounded by mountains and and hills on all sides. To give you a little bit more context, the Decapolis, which is the modern-day Golan Heights, sits 2,500 feet above sea level. So the sea is actually down in, it's like a bowl, which makes it very, very susceptible to just sudden and very violent storms coming along into that area. And so we shouldn't be surprised by what we read next. Verse 37, suddenly a storm struck the lake. Waves started breaking into the boat, and it was rapidly becoming swamped. Again, visualize this. It's dark out. They're already on this difficult journey anyway. And now all of a sudden, one of the big storms that they're famous for, it comes up, and the wind is just whipping and the waves are growing bigger and bigger and bigger. In fact, they're, they're crashing into the boat. Everybody is convinced that they're going to drown. Well, that is everybody except for Jesus. Jesus isn't worried at all. You know why Jesus isn't worried at all? Let's look at verse 38, the very first part of the verse. We read, Jesus was in the back of the boat with his head on a pillow, sound asleep. You're going, how in the world, if such a ferocious storm has come up, can you sleep through all that? Well, I'll tell you how. When I used to travel for uh, Purpose Driven, I was on flights all the time, usually three to five flights per week. And Lisa would sometimes travel with me. And she was pretty smart about her travel. You know, she would say, where are you flying to next week? And I'd be like, I'm in Buffalo, Green Bay, and Boise. She'd be like, "Eh, I don't really think I want to go on that trip. The next week, it'd be like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to be in Orlando, Dallas, and Phoenix. She'd be like, you know, I I really feel the Spirit is leading me uh, to to go along on this particular trip. So anyway, Lisa was on this trip with me. We were in Tampa, and we were getting ready to fly back to Maryland, to BWI. And we were on the runway. We were in line, ready to take off. And like these violent thunderstorms come along, lightning all over the place. And the pilot comes over the intercom and he says, unfortunately, because of lightning, everything is grounded. 
And so we're just going to keep you here on the plane. It probably will be a half hour, hour, something like that. We're just going to keep you on here instead of deplaning. But because it is going to be a little while, we're going to actually shut the engines off. So I said to Lisa, I was like, you know, we're not scheduled to get back to Baltimore until late anyway. This is going to make it even later. So I think I'm going to take a nap. She says, okay. So I like lean over against the window. I'm out. A little bit later, I wake up and I said to her, any word yet of when we're taking off? And she just looks at me and says, we're getting ready to land in Baltimore. <laughs> I had slept through all the thunder and the lightning. I had slept through the engines restarting. I had slept through the noise of the takeoff. I had slept a couple hours in <laughs> beyond that. Sometimes you just need a nap. That's where Jesus was at in this story. Sometimes you just need a nap. Now, here's the good news. You and I are called to be more like Jesus. And so if Jesus napped, then you need to nap as well. It's in there somewhere. I think it's the 11th command. I don't know if <laughs> No, actually, it's very good for you to take naps. I know you younger people, you kids are like, I hate naps and stuff. Trust me, once you get to be an adult, you appreciate naps. In fact, I learned sort of the science behind napping Many, many years ago, I was in my early 20s when I actually studied what is the proper way to take a nap, because most people don't nap properly. And I'm not going to give you another mini sermon within the sermon on this, but if you're interested in it, I'll tell you the science behind it. But it's actually very, very good to take a nap every single day. And I do. 17 minutes every single day. I take a 17-minute nap every single day. And what that allows me to do is I only usually sleep six hours per night. But then I get 17 hours, or 17, uh, yeah, 17 hours. I get 17 minutes in uh, during, during the day, which means I only do sleep for six hours and 17 minutes every single day, which means I get an extra almost hour and 45 minutes in a day that the typical person doesn't get when they're sleeping eight hours. And I've done this for years and years and years and years and years. People go, Gilbert, how do you get all this stuff? I mean, you're involved in that, and you're involved with it, and you're doing this, and you're doing that. How do you do that? 17-minute nap. It's the key. <laughs> And Jesus. <laughs> anyway, Jesus is really tired. <laughs> He's sleeping through this storm. The disciples, they have a little bit different idea of what's going on. Look at verse 38, the second part of the verse. His disciples woke him and they said, Teacher, don't you care that we're about to drown? That's a pretty weird statement. Jesus has been sleeping, but yet they're blaming him for something, even though he had nothing to do with it. And isn't that our culture today? Isn't it like this blame culture that people are always pointing the fingers, always attributing wrong motives to people? I mean, some of you may have gotten caught up in this, especially when it comes to politics, that you're just constantly blaming, you're constantly just attributing false motives to people. And that's not good. And so one of the things that, especially when it comes to politics, you got to ask yourself is this. The words that are coming out of my mouth or the things that I'm typing out is the majority of that things I'm just regurgitating because of I heard it on my favorite news you know, broadcast or I hear it on my, my favorite social media platform. Is that where the majority of my thinking and words are coming from? Or is the majority of my words and my thinking and what I'm typing out coming from my time of revelation in God's word, that what God through his spirit is revealing to me, is that what's coming out at, uh, to me and through me? Too much of what we say anymore is just our opinion and our thoughts. We've got to get back to communicating clearly God's word. So again, uh, I'll stop there, but think about that. Let's get back to the story. They've just woken Jesus up. There's a major storm going on. What does Jesus do? Does, does he grab an oar and, and start paddling? Does he get a, a bucket and he's starting to, to bail water out of the boat? You know, what, what does Jesus do? Does he do anything like that? No, he doesn't. Look at verse 39. Jesus got up, rebuked the wind to stop, and ordered the sea be still, absolutely still. The wind stopped blowing. And the sea became very calm. 
Now, if you've been around the church or the Bible for very long, you probably already knew how that story was going to end. And the problem with that type of familiarity is that we lose a little bit of the sense of awe and wonder of the shock of Jesus was sound asleep. There's this violent storm. They all think that they're going to die. Jesus wakes up and calmly rebukes the wind. He rebukes the waves. Everything becomes still. Imagine being one of Jesus' disciples and that happened. Can you imagine that? They're like, even the wind and the waves obey this guy. Just shock and, and awe. They wake him up, and with one grand gesture, he demonstrates that he has the power and the authority even over nature itself. With one grand gesture, he proves that no matter how stormy or dire the circumstances may look, he has the power and the authority to change the atmosphere. Now remember, Jesus has commissioned you and I with his authority to go out and change the atmosphere of anywhere that we place our feet as well. In your school, in your neighborhood, at your workplace, in your church, in your city, in your nation, and in the world, he has given you his power. He has given you his authority to change the atmosphere. And so that's why we can't be afraid to do great and mighty things for him because his spirit operating in us will give us the ability to change the world. But we can't try to change the world the way everybody else is trying to change the world. We can't get on Twitter and just rant about, you know, the latest thing that we're not happy with. We don't rebuke things in the way the world rebukes things. We rebuke things the way Jesus did with an opposite spirit. And so we rebuke hate with love. We rebuke pride with humility. We rebuke cursing with blessing. We rebuke lies with truth. We rebuke injustice with righteousness. We rebuke racism with repentance and reconciliation. We rebuke cancel culture with grace. Again, last week I shared with you, you've been given the power and authority by Jesus to move mountains, to part the seas, to lay hands on the sick and to heal them, to raise the dead. You have the power over evil spirits. But we often don't walk in that type of authority because we've forgotten that Jesus has given us that authority to begin with. Now, let me say this. Just because you have the authority and just because you pray those prayers doesn't mean it's always going to happen because it still has to be in the will of God. And God sees a much bigger picture than what we see. And so sometimes you're going to pray for somebody that's sick and they're still going to die. You still had the power and the authority over that. But for whatever reason, Jesus has that bigger picture. He saw something that you couldn't see. And it's always going to be for his good and for his glory. But just because you don't always see those results doesn't mean that you shouldn't be praying those prayers. Because sometimes he is waiting for you to have that grand gesture to reach out and to touch somebody and lay your hands on them and heal them or whatever it may be. So keep praying those bold prayers of faith. All right, so with all that said, how does all this play into grand gestures and, and cutting the rope? Well, first of all, I realize that there are a couple types of grand gestures. The, the first type would be what we may call the field of dreams or the if you build it, they will come type of grand gesture, right? Noah, he builds the ark, right? That, that's a grand gesture. If you build it, in that case, literally nobody came. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, you, you have people like Abraham who doesn't even know where he's supposed to go, but yet he decides to leave anyway trusting that God is going to show him the exact place to go. A grand gesture like this is the young boy he has five loaves and, and two fish, and he gives it to Jesus so that Jesus can feed the 5,000. So that's the, if you build it, they will come. The second is the enough is enough. This is when you hit a point of no return. You say, you know what? I'm never, ever going back. It's now or never. This is David's decision to fight Goliath. It's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's their decision to refuse to bow down to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. It's Jesus cursing the barren fig tree. Both kinds, the, 
that if you build it, they will come, and the enough is enough. Both require that you cut the rope, but you're going, okay, but how do you do that? Let me give you two ways to cut the rope. Because there's not literally, for most of us, going to be a rope that you're going to go, oh, there it is, I'm going to cut the rope now. It's figuratively, you're going to cut the rope in some ways. But there are still some actions that you need to take physically yourself. And so the first one is this, if you're taking notes, I have to kneel down. You've got to kneel down. In order to do anything great for God, for your dreams to come true, to to push through that barrier that you've been holding back from, you have got to kneel down. It's going to require revival. Now, God was speaking to the nation of Israel about revival and what they needed to do. And I've shared this with you before. There's a lot of things that God speaks to the nation of Israel that don't apply to us. It doesn't apply to America. But yet there's still some principles that we can learn. So here's a very famous verse. You see it on plaques all over. If you go to the Christian bookstores and stuff, you see it everywhere. Now I'll explain a little bit more in just a second, but let's read it. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Again, this was a promise to Israel, but there is still some things we can take for ourselves, and that is this. If you want revival to come, it's going to require humility, and it's going to require repentance. In the 1860s, there was a man born by the name of Rodney Smith. Rodney Smith was born in London. He had no formal education at all, However, Rodney Smith ended up lecturing many times at Harvard University. Two different sitting presidents of the United States asked him to come and give counsel to him. Rodney Smith crossed the Atlantic 45 different times in order to preach the gospel to millions and millions and millions of people. And everywhere that Rodney Smith went, revival broke out. Now, he got the name Gypsy, the nickname Gypsy, because he was doing all this travel. But everywhere he goes, it's revival. People's lives are being greatly changed. It was amazing. You're going, wow, he must have been a really great preacher. Well, he was a great preacher. But remember this, great preaching stirs the hearts of men and women. But what stirs the heart of God is people on their knees in prayer. But most people don't get that. And most people in his day, they didn't get that either. And there was other pastors that they came to him and they said, Rodney, you need to teach us. What is it that you're doing? Everywhere you go, revival breaks out. Teach us what it is that you're doing. He said, okay, I'll teach you what I'm doing. And he said this, and we have it. Here's his quote. Go home, lock yourself in your room, kneel down in the middle of the floor and with a piece of chalk, Draw a circle around yourself. There on your knees, pray fervently and brokenly that God would start a revival within that chalk circle. Revival doesn't start out there. Revival starts in here. You want revival? In your church, at your workplace, at your school, in our community, in the world, in our nation. Starts with every single man, woman, boy, and girl that is a follower of Jesus getting on their knees and fervently praying and brokenly praying to God, confessing our sin to him. It starts with repentance of God, change me first. Change me first. And then I'll change the world. Look, God wants you to change the world, but that shouldn't be your prayer of, God, help me to change the world. Your prayer should be, God, change me. Because I know if you change me, then I will change the world. But our thing is we just tack prayers onto the end of meetings or the beginning of meetings. We tack prayers onto our meal time.
This is something every single Christian, every single day, you need to spend deep time in prayer. Grand gesture of getting on your knees and humbly admitting to God that I am broken, but you can put those broken pieces back together and you can use me then for your glory and for your honor. When you start praying in that way, that's the difference between fighting with God, with God on your side, and now God fighting for you. It's not just God help me, it's God change me. And when God changes you, then he's going to fight for you. So number one, you have to kneel down. Number two, I must stand up. So you've gotten down on your knees. You've you prayed, God, change me. Give me a dream. Give me the vision of what you would have me to do in this world to change it. And when, once God gives you that dream, that, that vision, now it's time to stand up and go do it. No matter how big it is, no matter how scary it may seem, you need to cut the rope. You need to go ahead and do it. In 1955, in the beginning of 1956, Martin Luther King Jr., he had, was just getting to the place where he was like really starting to fight for, for civil rights. But he wasn't fully committed yet to it. But he thought, maybe, maybe this is what God is calling me to do. And on January 30th of 1956, he was preaching in a Baptist church. It was an evening service. And they stopped the service and they came up and they interrupted him and they whispered in his ear, somebody just drove by your house. They threw a pipe bomb onto your front porch and it exploded. Now, thankfully, only damage was done to the house and his wife and his young infant daughter who were inside, they were uninjured. But later on that night, Martin Luther King, he was back at the house. He was sitting around his kitchen table and he said it was then that God spoke to him through the spirit and said, Martin, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And it was that night then that really changed the course of his life, that he made the decision to cut the rope, that I'm not going to hold back anymore. And here's what he wrote about that. He said, you may be 38 years old as I happen to be, and one day, some great opportunity stands before you and calls you to stand up for some great principle, some great issue, some great cause. And you refuse to do it because you're afraid. You refuse to do it because you want to live longer. You're afraid that you'll lose your job or you're afraid that you'll be criticized, that you'll lose your popularity, or you're afraid that somebody will stab you or shoot you or bomb your house. And so you refuse to take the stand. Well, you may go on and live until you're 90, but you're just as dead at 38 as you would have been at 90. And the cessation of breathing in your life is but the belated announcement of an earlier death of the spirit. What a powerful, powerful quote. Mark Batterson in his book, Win the Day, which we're basing this series off of, he sort of summarizes very succinctly what Martin Luther King Jr. was saying there. It's on your outline if you're taking notes. Quit living as if though the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Really let that sink in for a second. Quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. If you're truly a follower of Jesus, he is going to call you to big things in your life. And those big things should be scary because if they're not scary to you, that means you don't need God. So dream big dreams, pray bold prayers, go after great opportunities. But in order to do that, you're going to have to cut the rope. That grand gesture of cutting the rope, not playing it safe any longer. 
So go ahead and take the chance. Take the risk. Cut the rope. Go out and let's win the day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that once again, we've been able to just learn a very practical principle for our lives through a, a very simple story of Elisha Otis, who said, you know what, in order to prove to everybody that my safety break works, I'm just going to cut this rope. And it was because they did that, that then people believed and the world then changed. Lord, whatever it is that's in our hearts and in our lives that you're calling us to do, that, that big dream, that, that, that bold prayer that we've been praying, but yet we've been scared of. Lord, I pray that first of all, we would kneel down before you and in humility, just say, God, I am too small for this. I don't have the gifts or the skills or the abilities or talents to do it. And I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Change me. And give me the boldness and the power through your spirit to do all the things that you call me to do. Not because of me, but because of you. And then Lord, once we have that that bold confidence as we're there on our knees, then help us to stand up that next grand gesture, to stand to our feet and to go out and do whatever it is that you've called us to do. No matter how scary it may be, no matter how big that giant may look, help us to be bold. Help us to do what it is that you've called us to do. Again, we know that Lord, when we do those things and those great things happen through us, like for Rodney Smith, people are like, man, this guy's uneducated. But yet, look at how God uses him to bring revival. Well, it wasn't because of Rodney Smith. It was because of him praying in that chalk circle every single day in humility and in faith. The broken spirit and a contrite heart. Father, help that to be us. Help us not to hear these cool stories and think, yeah, but they're somebody special. No, they're not. They're only special because, Jesus, you made them special. And so if you made them special, that means that we're special as well. And so use us to do great and mighty things for you for your glory, and for your honor. Lord, help us to cut the rope. Help us to win the day. We pray all this in your precious and holy name. In the name of Jesus, amen.